Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Catherine Russell, the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. Ambassador Russell leads the State Department's efforts to advance gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls around the world, a very important and incredibly uh, timely issue. In this role, she focuses on addressing gender-based violence, promoting women's full participation in society, investing in adolescent girls, and integrating women's issues into U.S. foreign policy. Um, before that, she brings a legacy of, of, of public service and leadership that spans the government. So we are very lucky to have um, Ambassador Russell, so please join me in giving her a warm welcome. a little dance there. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to be here, not least of which because this is the most beautiful space in town, and it's a perfect day. Um, and it was also really nice for me to hear uh, Terrell speak because she and I are old friends and colleagues. We both worked for, he was then Senator Biden, on the Hill um, many years ago. So it's great to see her in this space and doing such amazing work. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, this is an issue. These, these violence issues are things that particularly in the online space, that the more I learn about, the more concerned I, I get. And it's funny, as I was sitting here listening to the discussion before, that's not an area I'd even thought about. And I have children, so now I'm going to have to go home and like rethink. I, I, it's kind of disturbing to me. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. So I, I guess I would say this. You know, We obviously are in a moment of transition um, in, in our government. And so I think this conference is a really important opportunity for us to see where we stand and find ways um, to do more and to try to do better and to continue to, to have this conversation and push this dialogue along. I'm interested in this issue from two perspectives, which you can easily guess given my title. One is in the, sort of the work that we do to support women and girls around the world, and also just in the, the sort of the violence that we see that women are facing in many places. Um, when you think about how the internet can change people's lives, it's clear that this work is critical. Um, the internet is a place where we can you know, find our friends, read history books, explore other cultures. Um, we can start new businesses. We can do all sorts of positive things. Um, and in my work, I've seen how powerful the internet, particularly social media, can be when it comes to making progress on key human rights issues like women's rights. In the past year, however, we have seen countless online conversations about gender-based violence, and they've gone viral. It's been really interesting to see that process. In the Ukraine and Russia, thousands of women started to use a hashtag called I'm not afraid to say, um, which was an opportunity for them to share their personal experiences with sexual assault. In China, individual stories of women who experienced abuse at the hands of intimate partners have gone viral on something called Weibo, which is the Chinese version of Twitter. And in the United States, women have shared their stories under any number of hashtags. And often we would then see those stories picked up by mainstream media and, and see some of the stories in the New York Times and other sources. When you consider that one in three women will experience some form of violence in her lifetime around the world, it's no surprise that there are a lot of stories to share and a lot of women who want to share those stories. But the stigma around sexual assault is almost as universal as the violence itself. And that's where online and digital spaces have made a real difference. They've given survivors connection and community and inspired national conversations on a historically incredibly difficult issue to talk about. We can hope that these stories will change minds, change harmful gender stereotypes, and ultimately change these devastating statistics that we see about gender-based violence around the world. For this and for many other reasons, the internet should be a tool that everyone can use and a place where everyone can go and feel safe doing it. But as we know, that is far from a reality today. For every triumphant story about how the internet helps perpetuate good, there's a story about how it helps perpetuate violence, harassment, and inequality. Just this week, I saw a report that 47% of Americans have experienced some form of harassment online. What's interesting is that while both men and women are harassed online, the nature of the harassment is different for women. The abuse experienced by women, especially young women, is more likely to have a severe negative impact on their lives offline. Men report being called names or being embarrassed, uh, while women report being stalked or sexually harassed or threatened with rape online. And these instances don't happen in a vacuum. When a woman running for office finds a photo of herself online, photoshopped into a sexually explicit scene, that has an impact on women's ability to participate in democracy. 
it's one of the issues that we work around on the work on around the world is trying to encourage more women into the political space. That kind of intimidation is really detrimental to the work that we're doing. When a woman posts an opinion or a joke online and receives threats of rape in return, that has an impact on freedom of expression. When the reputation of a business is wrongly attacked on YouTube or on Yelp simply because it's owned by a woman, which was so surprising to me when I saw the data on that, that has an impact on women's economic opportunity. Again, something that we're working on aggressively around the world. That impact means that gender-based violence online matters to all of us. It matters to people who care about strong political systems and freedom of expression, to people who care about the economy and entrepreneurship, to people who care about funny jokes and even TV shows, and to people who want their children to use the internet without fearing for their safety. It matters from a foreign policy perspective as well. Gender-based violence is a, one of the key issues that I've worked on even before I got to the, to the um, State Department, but certainly while at the State Department, because we've seen how it holds back women and girls from getting an education, from earning an income, from participating in the political process, and ultimately from contributing in a meaningful way to their societies. And that holds all of us back from reaching our shared goals of peace, prosperity, and security around the world. So addressing these forms of violence, wherever they occur, is an important US foreign policy priority. The good news is together there are things we can do. Uh, I'd like to offer three things um, that we've been thinking about, ways that government, civil society organizations, and the private sector can work together to address the issue of gender-based violence online. First, we have to acknowledge that it is a problem that needs to be solved. Sometimes people look at these issues and they say, well, it's inevitable, or there's just nothing we can do about it. The National Democratic Institute, which does um, support for political uh, work around the world is, and does really important work trying to promote democracy, recently launched a campaign called It's Not the Cost, because they kept hearing people say over and over again that for women running for office around the world, violence online was simply the cost of being a part of the political system. And they said, that, that's not OK. You know, we can't just accept that. Violence is not the price women should have to pay. And it's not the price democracy should have to pay either. Women's voices and experiences are too critical to public discourse. So we need more researchers. We need more journalists. We need more advocacy organizations to follow in the footsteps of the important work that the Family Online Safety Institute is doing to acknowledge that this is a problem that we all care about and to put a gender lens on their work that they're doing. Second, we need to break down the barriers that keep women from thriving in the technology sector and these barriers are real. There are many reasons that we need more women and girls pursuing science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, STEM fields, and gender-based violence uh, on the internet is really high on that list. We need women serving as CEOs, board members, engineers, product designers, customer service representatives. That way, when products are designed, when new features are tested, when issues come up, women are at the table and they're bringing their perspectives and their experiences to bear. By the way, this is more than a pipeline problem, although it certainly is a pipeline problem. Institutions need to address the systemic discrimination that hold women back from succeeding in STEM fields. There is a lot of discussion about this, a lot of emerging research on it, but it's a critically important area. Finally, we need institutions to take action at an institutional level. I know how hard it can be, believe me, this is the, this is the job I do every day to change the way an institution behaves. For the past three years, I've been trying to change the way the State Department looks at issues uh, of women and girls and trying to make sure that those are included more fully in our plans, our policies, our programs. It's certainly not an easy task, and I appreciate that. But by and large, I think people understand that these issues matter and that UN for US foreign policy is stronger and more successful when, as the president said, it includes the voices and experiences of women and girls. From my perspective, that's where we stand on this issue. We need to articulate exactly what the problem is and the ways we can work together at every level of leadership to solve it. And that's the challenge we face today. We need everyone from experts and entrepreneurs to CEOs to survivors to developers to rights defenders to journalists and policymakers to come together and really try to find solutions that work. There's no question in my mind that the United States should continue to be a leader in this effort. 
We have experience based on the long work that we've done on the Violence Against Women Act here in the United States. We have the moral standing, and this is something that I see everywhere I go. People look to the United States as a champion of democracy and free speech and human rights, and that role that the United States plays is unmatched by any other country in the world, and that needs to continue. And we have the unique role of being a country where the world's largest tech companies are based. So our responsibility could not be more clear, but the clock is definitely ticking. Technology moves so quickly, you, you all know that better than anybody, and it, it has a way of getting ahead of policy. And the longer that happens, the harder it becomes to figure out what frameworks are needed to make these spaces accessible to everybody. I'd like to end with just a reminder of what's at stake, and this is, this is from my world of, on the international side. Um, there's a woman named, was a woman named Kandil Baloch, who was a, a Pakistani woman. These people referred to her as the Kim Kardashian of Pakistan. She was very controversial online. Uh, she became famous in Pakistan for her selfies and her cultural commentary, and she did a lot of important commentary on women and women's rights. Some people dismissed her, while others uh, really felt that she stood as a symbol of women's rights in Pakistan. But she was killed by members of her family, all because her online presence um, was viewed as a, a dishonor to her, to her family. And so for her, the cost of being online and for speaking her mind was her life. Violence should not be the price that women pay to be online. Uh, but it's up to us to ensure that freedom to say what you think, to be online, are not freedoms for some, but freedoms for all. So thank you so much for the work you're doing. I beseech you to keep these issues about women and violence at the top of mind as you think about the policies. And I really appreciate everything that's happened here. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it.